Hey, it's Jamie Moore here. You're on the Off the Ball League of Ireland podcast. Just heard from the Waterford midfielder and Irish 21s man, Zach Elbazetti, who is in France playing with the Irish 21s in the Toulon tournament. And now we're off to Derry to join the Derry City uh, vice captain, one of them anyway, and midfielder Greg Slugger. Greg, good afternoon. How are you? Jamie, how's things? Great stuff, sir. Yourself, thanks for having a chat. No worries at all. Glad to be on. Yes, thank you for joining us. Now, firstly, an image of Greg playing for Derry against Pat recently with a very sore nose. He's got his captain's armband on, the green Derry jersey, and he looks like uh, a young version of Robbie Fowler from back in the day. Uh, but, Greg, I'm joking about it, but you actually were off injured in that game like four times with a nose slash issues with blood. And on the occasion when you were off, the man you would have been marking on the corner, Kevin Toner, actually scored the winning goal in that match. He did, yeah. Um, there was a couple of occasions where there was a a drop, or, drop of blood just underneath my nose and the ref uh, unfortunately sent me off the pitch twice for set pieces and, and one of those set pieces um, Kevin Toner scored and he was my man for the corner so kind of left us a bit at bay and that was the that was the difference in the game so it was frustrating ultimately but um, look these things happen. Yeah, like you were so in the wars in that game. It was an injury that happened early on and there was a couple of other times where you went up for headers and you were like, God, there's going to be another clash of heads here. What was the initial injury? And, and I suppose in your career, have you had to go off three or four times in a game because of like a li- literally a tiny bit of blood on your face? Like, No, to be honest, I've never really had anything like that happen. I think once maybe in school, boys, something similar happened. But to be honest, I've never had such disruption in a, in a game for such a small sort of thing, or at least it felt like... Um, I still haven't got it cleared up whether my nose is broken yet or not. I was only in this morning to, to try and get an x-ray, but it didn't um, It didn't happen in the end. I've been referred to an ENT clinic, so hopefully that'll be sorted soon enough. But it's not um, It's not um, in, in in bad shape anyway, so thankfully. Yeah, yeah, well, thanks for having the chat, particularly on Skype as well. The nose doesn't <laughs> look too bad, even if it's still a bit sore. <laughs> it's a bit swollen, but sure, it's not, it's not off to one side, so touch wood. Yeah, I had to talk Greg into coming on Skype. Now I know why. I didn't realise the nose was still that bad. Uh, and how frustrating is it? Like, like the fourth officials in the League of Ireland are so busy telling managers to sit down, telling managers to stop shouting, telling subs where to warm up and stuff. And like so, so officious that if there's a tiny speck of blood, I understand if there's blood pouring for your face or it's all over your jersey, but you'd been off, you'd been treated. The physio had originally shoved stuff up your nose and then I think after half time they managed to find the plaster. But it just must be so frustrating when you're in the heat of battle and you're being dragged off every five minutes for something so, you know, so stupid really. Yeah, it really is, and, and I couldn't see. I couldn't even see the blood on my face, but I, I'm going off, and, and Physio, Mickey, telling me, you know, look, he's pointing at, at the Ford official, and then getting the Ford official to come and look at me, and he's saying, where's the blood? Where's the blood? You know, we can't we can't even see the blood that the ref has seen. So, you know, obviously it's it's that minimal. Um, but, look, these things happen to the ref, referees and Ford officials, and they can only do their job, and they try to do that as best as possible. It just was unfortunate the timing... Of um, of sending me off the pitch, you know. I think there was a couple of op- other opportunities they they could have sent me off if 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 they felt it was, you know, too bad to to play on. But it just happened to fall when um when the set piece was was there. So yeah, and is that something that you know maybe from the point of view of your team could have been reorganised quicker, or was it one of those things where it was your man and in the league of Ireland in general, if you're wearing number four for Derry or number six for Derry, you're being told you're marking number four from St. Pat's and number 10 from St. Pat's and everybody else has a man to mark. And if, if you're not on the pitch at the time, he happens to be free. Yeah, look, I think ultimately it was a lack of communication from everyone. I think, you know, I've been instructed to go off the pitch and I, I should be making sure going off the pitch that, that my man is being picked up. And again, everyone else in the box is, is has an equal responsibility to make sure that there's, there's no man free. And... Um, but ultimately, it does leave you a man short and your, your jobs are assigned before the game and we all know what's what then. Um, so it does cause some disruption, but that just needs to be dealt with on the spot. So unfortunately, it wasn't and, and that was the difference in the game. Yes, yeah, so you were at the hospital earlier on today on, on Wednesday to, to try and get a scan. It didn't happen. So will you be fit to be available for selection against Shamrock Rovers this Saturday? Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, sure. I've, I've played played since. Um, it's, uh, it's one of those injuries I, I think you can just kind of afford to play on with somehow <laughs> and have you had to wear a special mask or because I, no, I didn't see any images last week okay not at all um, it's just kind of disrupted my breathing a little bit because it's still swollen on, on one side of the, the nose and one nostril but apart from that you know plenty of Vicks and <laughs> and your grand so it's not it's not too bad yeah really looking forward to being at that game I think it's 7 o'clock kickoff in Tallis Stadium this coming Saturday because Ireland are playing Denmark on Friday so all the League of Ireland games are moved to Saturday 
Greg, how have you found your time playing so far in Derry? You joined there, having been with UCD, I think since, was it 2015 you joined UCD 19s and, and you very quickly moved into the first team there. You played like a huge number of games there, earned the club last season to get promoted from the first division FAI Cup semi-final against Dundalk as well and, and you were signed by Declan Devine and Derry and uh, you're one of, I think, three vice captains as well. You've won the captain's armband a couple of times too. Yeah, look, I've settled in great up here. Um, it's been a relatively stress-free and, and hassle-free process. You know, Declan has has had a tough job in, in organising a club that was, you know, on its knees in many ways at the end of last season. And, and a lot of players have gone out and a lot of players have come in. And, you know, I think he settled the ship well. Um, but look, we're all just giving 110%. And, you know, he knows I'm going to give that as much as possible every week. Um, and... You know he he values that, so it's it's been it's been straightforward enough for me, um, and I'm just look I'm delighted to be playing week in week out in Premier Division and and show being able to showcase what I'm all about. How does it work with the? I mentioned like three vice captains. I think the captain is Barry McNamee. He's missed a couple of games this season. I know you've captained the team. I know one of your midfield partners, Kieran Harkin, has captained the team as well. And I think someone else. How does that work? Is it like sort of like um, the manager has decided to create like a players' committee as such, or, or what's the idea behind it? Well, yeah, it's just myself and, and Kieran Harkin were named vice captains at the start of the season, and um, obviously we have we've had a ton of games, so rotation has been has been necessary. Um, ultimately, so you know, vice captains have to step up and 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 take the role of captain once every now and again. So, um, and it's a it's a it's a privilege and honour to do that. You know, it's such a big club, and and for Declan to put his trust in me, as Jackie, I'm sure would say the same. And um, Kieran Harkin, that is, uh, you know, it's 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 great, and it's it's great confidence he instills in us to to lead such a, such a big club. Yeah, I always try when I get to a League of Ireland game, I, you know, in the press box, you're handed a team sheet, but I try and watch the game for five minutes and work out that's him and that's him. And in general, you get the majority of all the teams. But I was at that game recently in Richmond and all the Finn, all of the, uh, not the Finn Harps players, the players from Derry are calling Kieran Harkin Jackie. And I'm going, who's Jackie? But it's Kieran Harkin who is called Jackie. Why? Yeah, I'm not 100 percent sure that the reason. I think it's um, it's a name uh, he was donned when he was younger, and in relation to Jackie Chan, and he's a, he's a bit of a character in his, his movements and stuff. So I, I'm not 100 percent sure. You'd have to ask him him that. But um, yeah, it, it, it stems from that somewhere. Does he have a Jackie Chan style karate kick or a karate chop? <laughs> he does. Yeah, he does. He does indeed. He grips it out in training every now and again. Well, there you go. My next Derry City guest has got to be Jackie Kieran Harkin, and I'm going to ask him to uh, to show us this karate kick on Sky, which could end terribly, but I'm going to ask him anyway. But that's very interesting that, that, that he's called Jackie, and yourself and himself, and when Barry McNamee has played, have formed a nice midfield trio. Yeah, look, it's enjoyable, enjoyable that, you know, to play with such a such a talented bunch of players in general, the whole team, you know. Um, as I said, Declan has really done well to kind of fabric... Uh, a, a, a very good squad in such a short space of time so yeah look it's it's brilliant to play with with both Jackie and, and Barry and, and there's a there's a handful of other great midfielders to, ready to go there when, when called upon Explain to me Greg the reason why you chose to sign for Derry because you being been at UCD you were an ever present in their team and you were in demand to stay at UCD but also with a couple of other clubs around the Premier Division I think to, to sign at the time in the off season and it's such an interesting time for players like you in that period when you're finished college and unfortunately for UCD they tend to lose their better players when they are finished college and they are going now with kind of a scholarship only model even though I'm sure the fact that you just finished you would have been able to stay for this season but you decided to leave so why choose Derry? Um, yeah I suppose it's a, it's a tricky one I mean you do as you say have a couple of couple of different offers I mean I suppose the big thing first and foremost for me was full-time football and um, to have that opportunity to to really commit to, to football is something I wanted to do all my life, and um, there was there was a couple of clubs um, around that that offered that. And then, you know, when I sat down and spoke to, to Declan and, and Paddy McCord as it was at the time, um, you know, they what they what they kind of sort set out to me in terms of um, the club and the values he wanted to instill and the, the players he wanted to bring in. You know, that was. That was the selling factor for me, really, um, the values he, he wanted to put. And, you know, he he told me first and foremost, you know, he's seen me as a as a, as a a player to play week in, week out and, and be a big factor of his team. And gratefully, I've, I've come in and been able to, to do that. So, you know, um, what, he, what he sold to me was the truth. And 
you know, honesty is is important when, when it comes to those sort of conversations because, you know, there's a lot of clubs where you'll go and um, I've seen previous players go and, and you know, the, the word of the manager hasn't always um, been true. But that's, you know, that can be the player's part or the manager's part, both. But, um, look, what he, what he sold to me was, was true and honest and, you know, I, I valued that. Yeah, for you at that time as well, you know, you're leaving, I suppose, UCD, which is a bubble. It's a great bubble, but it's a bubble all the same. And, you know, you're a young player and you've played a lot of games there and you've decided that you're likely to leave and you're meeting other managers and they're trying to sell their club to you. And as you said there, some of them are telling the full truth, some of them are telling the half truth, some of them are feeding you a load of bullshit to try and get you to sign. And then maybe it's not like that at all. How were you to deal with that? Did you have an agent? Did your parents help you? Or were you just old enough, you know, as someone in the early 20s to go, no, I'm going to go and meet these managers and, you know, look them in the eye and ask them what I want to ask them and, and see if I believe them, basically? Yeah, to be honest, you know, I have no agent to represent me. I just kind of stood up and spoke for myself, really. I mean, I think managers can offer you some some bullshit, as you say, but so can some agents. Um, so... You know, I, I just choose to, to represent myself and, and, and meet the managers face to face. I think I can have a have a decent judge of character and um and you know, first and foremost when I was sitting down with the the manager, I just wanted to, to see was he true and honest with me and, and, and what sort of um future he, he thought I would have in the league and, and, and going forward. So um Declan offered me a, a fair um fair representation of that, you know. Um so yeah. And shortly after you joined in pre-season, Greg, he brought the team and all the staff on a tour of the city of Derry. And I know that's something that you really enjoyed. And straight away, you were able to see the type of, of people that you were playing for and the history behind them. Tell me about that. And, you know, very early in your career at Derry, you really knew what it meant to play for the club, such a historic club with, with unbelievable history and an unbelievable city behind it, really. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's well documented, you know, that, that Declan has made a, made a big effort to to ensure that all the players know who or what they're playing for. Um, but even to take you back to before I signed, I, I went up and, and I met, met Declan and Paddy up in Derry um, a second time and we were sitting in a, in a place called the City Hotel in Derry and a couple of older ladies came up um, in the middle of the conversation and, and you know, wished, wished Declan and Paddy the best of luck for the next season. You know, this was in, you know, late November, early December so. You know, there was uh, there was already a, a sense of of how important it was to to everyone in the city, and um, when when even such as such an as older ladies are, are coming up who may not be uh, so well versed in in football, <laughs> maybe I'm I'm pitching out a stereotype there, but um, no, look, there's, there's there's great sport around the city, and 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 Declan has ensured that that all the players know what it means what it means to people, um, and he's sure and still that in the squad. So, Craig, now all the old ladies of Derry are going to be out there with their handbags and their umbrellas ready to beat you up for slagging them. <laughs> <laughs> They've been out in support, so it's, ah, it's no, great. I take your point. No, I do take your point. I'm sure it was very nice to be sitting there and some random old lady coming up to wish the club luck and you're going. Because, for example, you've always played your football in Dublin. There are so many clubs and, and you know, it's just when you are playing for a Derry or a Sligo or a Cork, I think from it, all the players you've spoken to, it is a totally different experience living there. You know, you're, totally you're, 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 you're exactly kind of in that Explain to me more about that, and you know, maybe you're walking down the road, and you know, the local people are the kids are giving you a high five, looking for an autograph, and it's all very, very, very much focused on the football there. Yeah, it really is. You know, it's a it's a big culture shock, especially coming from UCD, let alone a Dublin club. You know, um, a real culture shock, and you know, thankfully, I think from from the performances maybe of last season, which I, I'm not too sure, you know where things finished up at the end of the last season. Myself, I know a lot of a lot of the murmurs from around the club is that, you know, it was a bad atmosphere and stuff. But um the the vibe I'm getting now this season is that, you know, they're they're pleased to see everyone working hard and and, and, and put giving everything on the pitch. Um so you know that's um it's great, you know, it's great just to have the, the support of the people. It's great to have the support of people. And how have you found the life away from the football, living on your own as such, having to cook? I know you're in UCD, of course, but a lot of the time you can get your meals and, you know, you're on scholarship, so there's lots of help there. But to kind of move from being on campus in UCD for four years to Derry, and I know you've kind of stayed up there quite a lot. Lots of players that are off on a Wednesday, they try and come back down the road to Dublin where they live. But for you, you've stayed up there quite a lot and you've really 
started to enjoy living in Derry as well. Yeah, look, I suppose coming from from university life um, where you're so absorbed in young people around the campus and stuff, um, I suppose the biggest the biggest uh, trouble I found coming up was having that other kind of core group of friends and, and, and different people around um, other than the lads off the team, you know, so trying to trying to meet the people can, can be difficult moving to a new city and stuff. But, um, you know, thankfully it's, it's been good. I've, I've tried to immerse myself as, as much as possible and that's one of the reasons why I, you know, I don't go home so much is because I've, I've tried to take up some other kind of extracurricular things to do in, in my spare time. You know, that, that, that kind of keeps me um, busy and occupied and, and not lonely or, um, you know, bored up here, which is, you know, a, a common problem footballers um, claim to having. Um, so, you know, it's been great. And, you know, luckily I have some, some part-time work that I, that I do as well with, with a company based in Dublin, um, which, you know, offers me... The, the chance to, to continue my kind of professional career off the back of graduating in UCD. So all things considered, you know, it's 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 been it's been great really um, and things have really worked out a treat for me. One of those things you do, Greg, away from the football is you're into the music and you're learning to play the guitar, is it? <laughs> yeah, I play, I play a bit of guitar and I'm, I'm learning to play um, the saxophone up here as well. Wow, okay. Interesting. Uh, Tell me more about that. Nah, it's early stages. Uh, <laughs> there's uh, there's not much to test what I do there. I have, some of the lads give me a bit of slagging over, but yeah, uh, nah. Look, it's just uh, something else to 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 keep up while they're while they're while they're training and, and playing. So, but so, yeah. you, I'm told you're quite a good. You know, you're you're quite interested in music. The saxophone is a new hobby of yours, but you've been playing the guitar for quite a while, haven't you? I have. I just try to try to keep keep involved. You know it. Um, my brother and, and my, my parents would be would be quite musical and, and I've, I've picked that up off them um, but you know it's just a pastime and something that that brings me some enjoyment in, in my my downtime and, and, and personal life so yeah where is the saxophone now I'm not gonna ask you to play it don't worry no it's it's in the next room it's in the, it's in the city room no <laughs> I won't be playing that for anyone for a, for a long while yet. That would be a podcast for surely in League of Ireland podcast it's history. Really a player right. playing the saxophone for us. Next time, Greg, won't you practice a bit? <laughs> we'll see. So, from a football point of view, you mentioned meeting the manager, but someone else I'm sure who's been very influential in your signing and also in the training is Paddy McCourt, who I interviewed last year just after he you know, announced that he was leaving Finn Harps to go and join Derry as a coach and also as the academy director. Does he still put the boots on in training and to have someone like him? I know you're you're not, you know, overly similar in style. He would have been more of an, an attacking midfielder. You know, you're more someone that, that sits there and gets the team playing. But what's it been like being around him over the last few months? And, and, you know, the level of ability that he had as a player, I'm sure he can he can pass it on to players, you know, in a similar position very easily. Yeah, look, he's a, he's a class act, Paddy. Um, I think this question kind of gets asked a lot. I think people think he, he kind of gets involved more in training than, than he actually does. Um, I know he's, he's head of youth academy, so he's, he's quite busy that uh, with that. Um, and he's also involved in, in, in some of the player recruitment. So, you know, hopefully um, he can continue to bring other um, other players to the club and, and hopefully we can go on and be successful and he'll be a big part, part to play in that. But um, in terms of training, you know, he, he kind of got involved a good bit during preseason and, and since then it's kind of, it's kind of, waned off a bit but um no look he's, he's a class act and you know he, he gives little tips to certain players and and um, when he does train you can see he's just got a wonderful ability on the ball and yet he's so humble and um level-headed off the pitch so he's a, he's a great character to have around has he nutmegged you greg <laughs> everyone's nutmegged me um, <laughs> I always get nutmeg every it's a very, day. It's a very nice yeah, answer. <laughs> <laughs> so what kind of tips can he give you as a midfielder to help in the way the team wants to play? And, you know, I know what seems to be quite uh, common now in football is, you know, some of the coaching staff taking players aside before a game or before a session, actually sitting down with them, maybe with a tactics board or with some video clips and actually answering some questions and having, you know, a proper in-depth chat about that exact position. Yeah, look... Paddy has a wealth of knowledge. He can he can help to, to anyone on the team. You know, no matter what the position, I, I think Paddy has Paddy has something to offer. And you know, it's been no different. And, and Kevin Deary, the assistant manager, you know, he's he's a he's a former midfielder and, and you know, um, stalwart in the league around himself. You know, so he's he's a lot to offer as well. You know, so we, we do our video analysis and we do our 
we do our set plays and our, our training phases on on the pitch you know so there's 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 ample opportunity for for loads of advice from 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 all the staff there so you know that's that's the benefit of having full-time football at such a big club you know is is you, you have this wealth of knowledge and all this time to to make sure you're you're coached properly and and, and that's what i'm getting yeah and just lastly, Greg, on the overall life choice you made to, first of all, use UCD to play football and get a degree, and then I think get a master's, and then you were working full-time for a while in Dublin, and then you had to make the decision to leave that to go and play for Derry, but you're also still doing a bit of part-time work. I think I'm right in saying for the, for the same company. Tell us a little bit about that and just having your, your degree, and I think your master's in your, in your back pocket, still being able to do a little bit of work and play football, and I'm sure the work is great, you know, from a mental point of view, as not a distraction, but as something totally different from the football. Yeah, look, it was, you know, it was one of those things that kind of nearly, nearly stood in my way um, of, of almost coming here. It was was my commitment to, to work and and um, and my studies. You know, I finished into my degree and not having maybe the the most uh, attractive propositions during my time in, in college and then and then getting some good some good offers after you kind of kind of leaves you wondering where your football career might take you but it's it's a risk you you need to take um so you know thankfully the, the company the selective travel travel management who i who i work remotely for now um were were grateful uh, you know that they, they were i'm grateful to them that they agreed to to allow me to work part-time remotely here from from Derry and and you know it gives me the opportunity to continue my professional career in that sense um, as I say, um, and you know, at the same time, I get to completely dedicate my life, life to football and, and, and work my own timing schedule um, accordingly. So, you know, it's it's great to have to have both of them and and be able to keep keep both up in that sense. Because if if I uh, if I was just playing football, I think I'd I'd be at loggerheads with myself and um, for maybe letting that opportunity slip in some ways. And lastly, Greg, back to the football this Saturday. Shamrock Rovers away. It's been, you know, a mixed season for Derry. Certainly much better than last season. You're fourth, I think, uh, four points off third with a game in hand on balls too. So if you can go to, to Rovers, who've been really good this season, they're trying to keep pace with Dundalk. So it's a really intriguing game this Saturday in Tala. And you've played them a couple of times this season. You've already been in Tala and you've played them at the Brandywell too. So I think it's a third meeting you've, you've, you're going to face them with. It is. And unfortunately, we've come out on the wrong end of, of those previous two meetings. Um, I think the first game was thoroughly deserved. But when we played them up here, it was it was a closer game. And, and you know, one one moment of madness from, from us and a, and, a, and a good pass to play from them resulted resulted in a goal that, that set them apart. Um, so, look, we're looking looking forward to Tala on, going to Tala on, on Saturday night. It's a great place to go and play. Um, and we'll be we'll be able to go there and get the three points. Great stuff, Greg Slogger. Thanks a million for your time. Best of luck on Saturday. I'll see you there and off now for more saxophone practice. <laughs> Thanks very much, Jamie. Chat to you soon.